Father, and Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brethren in Christ, praise to Jesus Christ. Happy Epiphany. Welcome to another edition of the Meaning of Catholic Show. I'm Timothy S. Flanders. Um, we won't, we're, today we're going to talk about moral theology and R-rated movies. And so we're going to go into a little bit of moral theology about that, uh, talk about that topic. Tomorrow we're going to talk with Kennedy Hall, uh, continuing this topic, uh, and go into uh, video games, music. Um, we're going to talk about masculinity, effeminacy. Talk about those things all ahead of Septuagesima. Septuagesima is coming February 9. That's the pre-Lenten season. So we're doing a daily uh, spiritual preparation, talking about the spiritual life to prepare ourselves for the great fast. So, but first, before we talk about that, I wanted to point out, uh, one of my last shows I said um, that Pope Francis says that adultery can sometimes be okay. Now, a friend of mine pointed out that that's not exactly what he said, and it's true. He didn't exactly say that. So I wanted to clarify what exactly Pope Francis said about that um, so that can be absolutely clear. <clears throat> so what happened was Morris Letizia said that um, Catholics who are remarried, who are divorced and remarried without a declaration of nullity, which means they are in an objective state of adultery, where they are in a living situation, um, living the conjugal union with another person who is not technically their spouse. Uh, Morris Letizia says in a footnote that in some cases this can um, include particularly in the sacraments. Now, it's not clear in what cases, because Pope John Paul II and Benedict also and the, the whole moral tradition states that in order to receive the Holy Sacraments in a remarriage, if there is a situation where one cannot separate with this second spouse because of the children or some other circumstance, then the, the, the man and the woman must live as brother and sister. They cannot have carnal relations. They not, cannot have, uh, they cannot do the conjugal act because they're not actually married. And so that was the condition um, previously set about by the magisterium and the tradition in, in the type of situation that one cannot commit the conjugal act ever with someone who is not your spouse. So, um, and that is the only condition that one could actually approach the sacraments then because one was, would not be in moral sin by committing the conjugal act with someone who is not your spouse. So if you were living as brother and sister, then you could receive the sacraments. Those are the conditions. So... It's not clear what uh, Pope Francis meant by this. But then the Argentinian bishops released their guidelines about Mars Letizia. In it, they say, and I quote, In other more complex cases, and when a declaration of nullity has not been obtained, the above-mentioned option may not, in fact, be feasible. And when they say the above-mentioned option, they're referring to what I just said. So a man and a woman who are living as brother and sister, they are refraining from the conjugal act. They um, are just brother and sister. So that situation, the Argentinian bishops say, may not, in fact, be feasible. So then they continue, Nonetheless, a path of discernment is still possible. If it comes to be recognized that, in a specific case, there are limitations that mitigate responsibility and culpability, and then they re make reference to a moral statistia, especially when a person believes they would incur a subsequent wrong by harming the children of the new union. And here's, here's the key part. A moral statistia offers the possibility of access to the sacraments of reconciliation and Eucharist. These sacraments, in turn, dispose the person to continue maturing and growing with the power of grace. So what, what are they saying here? They're saying... If a man and a woman who are remarried, so they're not they're living with someone who's not their spouse, um, they're they're you know, they're living in an adulterous context. If they cannot refrain from committing adultery, they may still be able to receive the sacraments and grow in grace. So the Argentinian bishops are saying that 
you can commit adultery and still grow in grace, is what they're saying in this, in this state, in this statement here. So um, you can be in this objective situation. You can commit adultery. Now, to be fair, yes, there are situations and every mortal sin does have a culpability and a degree of culpability. That is correct. There, there are mitigating factors. But if a priest is speaking to an individual who is living in adultery, then it is incumbent upon a priest to inform that individual that he is living in adultery so that all the culpability or, or mitigating circumstances or ignorance or whatever would be removed so that that individual can repent and receive the sacraments in a state of grace. But instead, the Argentinian bishops are saying, well, at some point, living in brothers and sisters cannot, is not feasible. In, in other words, it's not feasible not to commit adultery sometimes, is what they're saying. So sometimes it's just not feasible to follow the Sixth Commandment. Sometimes it's just not feasible to refrain from adultery. That's what the Argentinian bishops are saying. And so then they're saying that you can still grow in grace. So this, this is the Argentinian bishops' interpretation of Amoris Laetitia. Okay. So then Pope Francis issued an official letter which approved of this document, this Argentinian document, and he added that into the Acta Apostolica Sedes, which is the official magisterial um, uh, do- collection of documents. So he is attempting to make this a magisterial act, and it was even stated that this is a, quote, authentic magisterium when he had this letter. And what did he say in this letter? He said, uh, no hay otras interpretaciones. There's no other interpretation of Amoris Laetitia than the Argentinian bishop's interpretation. So there, that's, Pope Francis put his stamp of approval officially on this interpretation, which says that sometimes it is not feasible to refrain from adultery, and you can still grow in grace. So, Pope Francis did not say, technically, sometimes adultery is okay. What he said was that in certain circumstances, there's some sort of mitigating culpability and it's not feasible to refrain from committing adultery. So therefore, an exception can be made in this, in this case, and they can continue to grow in grace and receive the sacraments. So that is the issue. So that is what Pope Francis said. So in my opinion, that amounts to saying that adultery is sometimes okay. That's what I'm saying. So I'm saying that that amounts to sometimes adultery is okay. He did not say that specifically, but by giving his stamp of approval to this statement of the Argentinian bishops, that's what he's kind of saying overall. So that is the whole controversy. So, but I wanted to clarify that because it is true that he did not say those words that I put in his mouth. So that's what he said. Those are the quotes. Um, That's that issue. Um, So another note, last week, I was on the Taylor Marshall show talking about my conversion from Eastern Orthodoxy. And this has provoked a strong reaction from many Eastern Orthodox online. And just wanted to let anybody know who had seen that or wanted to know that we will be doing a response to uh, the critical statements as much as we can on the Reason and Theology show. Right now it's scheduled for tonight. So 7 p.m. Eastern time. Tune in. We'll be live. I will be discussing the critical statements about that and we'll talk about that you can live chat and ask questions and things of that here so all right so let's move on to the moral theology um i wanted to talk about uh one patron had a question about mutual submission of spouses and i want to introduce one of the big authorities that i use besides prumer so we've talked about prumer prumer is basically everything in here is more or less sententia communis, if not more, and he'll know if there's any probability statements that aren't as uh, binding. Um, but he basically summarizes the moral um, tradition in a most pot compact way. Now, the issue is that, um, and if you get my book, I discuss this, 
how moral theology, even Ratzinger admits that moral theology collapsed after the Second Vatican Council is because they threw out the natural law. They threw out Prumer, and they wanted to do moral theology based solely on the Bible. But what happened was they, um, they ended up taking modern philosophy and applying that to the Bible to try to create a moral system. And that is what has been the downfall of, of our moral theology. Um, so the problem is that priests are no longer taught moral theology. They're no longer taught uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori moral theology. They no longer read Prumer. Um, they, don't, they don't become proficient in Latin because most of the sources are still in Latin. Most of these moral theology sources are still in Latin. Most of St. Alphonsus's moral theology is still in Latin. A lot of it's been translated by Ryan Grant, so you can go over to Mediatrix Press, get that moral theology. I would only recommend that text if, if you're more advanced. Uh, it's a more difficult than Prumer. Um, but the issue is that most of these texts are in Latin. So the problem is that most priests don't get the training. They're not required to get the, enough training in Latin to even study the moral theology. So there is one priest, and there are many other priests, I'm sure, but one prominent priest who does have that training, and that is Father Chad Ripperger. And he has a PhD in philosophy, and, and he knows Latin enough to study all of these Latin sources and learn his moral theology properly. So he is another source of authority that I use on other questions who I'm going to use in this talk when we talk about moral theology. So when we talk about uh, Father Chad Ripperger, um, I have not studied all of the sources that he has, so I cannot tell you what his judgment on some of these things is going to be in terms of the degrees of certainty. I, I take it at least as a sentencia communis. Um, I think we should take all bishops and priests as a sentencia communis, meaning we need to accept it unless we have grave cause otherwise. And I've grown to trust Father Ripperger as an authority in moral theology. So I'm, but I, I want to give that as a caveat because I, I, as much as possible, I try at Meaning of Catholics to present to you um, objectively just the Catholic faith, not my personal opinion as much as I can. So trying to just pass down what is the faith and not my personal opinion. But unfortunately, on a few on certain matters, there is a there is a, a lack of authorities on a subject. And that's those are the, some of the things we're going to talk about. So that's why I want to preface this by saying this is some of my opinion. So in my opinion, I think Ripperger is a very good authority in moral theology. So that's why I'm going to use him. But I wanted to make you know, you be aware that this is my opinion. And obviously, Father Ripperger is not a, he's a priest, and he certainly has authority, but, you know, he's not a uh, Vatican congregation or a particular um, authority given for these sort of a definitive answer on the, any of these things. So I wanted to preface all that. Um, so there was a question from a patron about mutual submission of spouses. So the issue is that there, on the one hand, there is mutual submissions uh, between husband and spouse. There are duties and rights between spouses that moral theology understands to be completely mutual, which means that both husband and wife have the duty to render these to each other always. And it's a completely equal uh, mutual submission. So each of them have to do this to each other. They need to mutually submit in these matters. And then there are also particular duties and particular rights. So there's a particular duties and rights for the husband, particularly duties and rights for the wife. And so this is where the other hierarchy happens, where there is a submission of the wife to the husband. So there is a hierarchy on the one hand with the wife submitting to the husband. On the other hand, versus, um, regarding other duties, there is a, a completely mutual submission where the, the husband has to submit to the wife in certain matters. So what are those matters? So first of all, the, so this is coming out of Prumer. Um, so the mutual duties are these. Let me get my page here. So here's the mutual duties. One, mutual love, both effective and effective, which means you're, you're, doing, uh, you're doing love, you're doing acts of love. You're also holding an affection, uh, affectionate love towards the spouse. Um, number two is rendering the mal marital debt. So the, the first primary end of marriage is children. The secondary end of marriage is mutual support and the remedy for lust. So this is a grave matter. So a husband or a wife must render the marital debt to his or her spouse 
if it is reasonably requested. So if if it's not reasonably request, requested, it is you know the spouse is not required to render the debt. But um, it is a, a grave matter. And why is it a grave matter? It's because marriage is a remedy for lust. When if a spouse refuses the marital debt for an unreasonable cause, then that spouse is exposing her or her spouse to lust. So it's basically just refusing to give the remedy of lust to your spouse. It's rendering that marital debt. So this, and the marital debt, the term marital debt comes from the Bible. That comes from St. Paul. This is, a, this is from the New Testament. So these are the inspired words of God to um, discuss these things. And unfortunately, this has become controversial, but it hasn't been controversial for hundreds of years until now. So, but that's a mutual submission. So husbands to wives, wives to husband. That's what St. Paul says. Um, render to each other. And so that is something that both husbands and wives owe each other. Um, marriage is a contract exchanging bodily rights. So St. Paul says that the husband does not have all rights over his body, nor the wife over her body. And so there is that rendering of the marital debt. That's the mutual submission. So then there's number three is uh, life in common. So you are obliged to live together in a mutual companionship. So then we go into the particular rights and duties. So the husband is obliged. So his duty is as head of the family to guide his wife, children, and servants. Two, to provide for his wife and family sufficient food, clothing, and maintenance. Now, um, sufficient food, clothing, and maintenance. What does this mean? Well, Ripperger understands this based on his sources as the father must provide enough food, clothing, shelter, uh, must provide enough so that the wife can be a full-time mom. And why is this? It's because the children have a right to their mother. The children have a right to their mother. So the woman has a right to stay home. So the father has a duty fulfilling that right right to uh, make enough money so that the, his wife can be a full-time mom and stay home and take care of the kids. So the, the kids have the right to their mom. The mom have a, has a right to her kids. So the father has a duty to provide. Now, there can be grave causes that cause that um, the wife needs to work because there is, you know, we just don't have enough money. There's a financial issue. Um, so this can be a grave cause. It can be a situation where you, you do need to have both spouses wife, uh, working, but the children have a right to their, their mother. And so that is why the father has that duty. Um, so then uh, number three is he has a duty to administer the family property wisely. So obviously the father can't just... Um, his headship, uh, Ripperger explains, his headship is given to him for the sake of his wife and children. So all of his authority needs to be rec needs to be exercised for their sake. So when he protects them and lays down his life and sacrifices for them, um, all of this needs to be for their sake. So that's uh, the husband's duty. So then the wife's duty is to uh, show due obedience to her husband and to pay careful attention to the home and to the education of the children. So uh, St. Pius, or not St., but Pius XI says that the home is the woman's truly regal throne. So she's been elevated as the queen of her home, and that is her domain. That is, that is what she makes for the children and for the home or the husband. That is her throne, her queenship. So that is an awesome privilege that women can participate in, in union with Mary, our Blessed Mother, who did the same for the Holy Family. So those are some of the basic um, rights and duties um, from the mutual submission, the, the roots and duties that are the same between spouses, and then there are the uh, these particular rights and duties. So this, I want to emphasize that this is very controversial, unfortunately, but this is really the standard that um, our fathers and mothers have been working uh, for centuries and centuries. And so that is the, the standard and the, and the basic culture that the Catholic Church and the Catholic family have had for centuries. And so this is, it's unfortunate that it's become controversial, but that's because we, we are not taking pride and, and um, taking joy in our duties and, and fulfilling these duties for the sake of our spouse, for the sake of the family, for the sake of the children. So um, if you uh, please leave comments and let me know your thoughts, anything like that. Um, but we're going to pass on to our, the main topic. So, um, movies. So when we talk about modern movies, 
a little bit more about the history. Um, and I want to review what we talked about in our daily video two days ago. And that was effeminacy. So effeminacy is defined by St. Thomas as um, a reluctance to suffer because of an attachment to pleasure. So we talked about the parts of the body and soul, which are the intellect and the will, which are in your soul, and then there's the concupiscible appetite and the irascible appetite. So the when we take in pleasure in our concupiscible appetite, we become attached to this pleasure. And then if we get too attached to this pleasure, we become ir reluctant to suffer. And that is effeminacy. That's the definition of it. So, um, so keep that in mind. This is going to be sort of the context of talking about movies today and tomorrow we'll talk more about music as well and video games and things of that nature with Kennedy Hall. So, <clears throat> but, so on the one hand, we do have a feminacy, so we don't want to be attached to pleasure. But St. Thomas also says that there's another virtue um, called eutropelia. He asked this question, is there any virtue in games? And he says, yes, there are virtue, there is virtue in games. And this, this virtue is called eutropelia. And this is how he explains it. He says, the soul's rest is pleasure. Consequently, the remedy for weariness of soul must needs consist in the application of some pleasure by slackening the tension of the reason's study. So what he's saying here is that when you're studying, when you're, when you're using your intellect and your will, and you're exercising this, and you're using, you're, you're fulfilling your duties, you're staying in life, you're working, uh, whatever that we, whatever form that may be, um, and he also even in contemplation, uh, prayer, uh, there needs to be recreation. There needs to be something where you are recreated, where you are revived, and that means taking some pleasure. We need to take some pleasure. So, the most uh, the easiest example of this is just food. Food feeds our concupiscible appetite. It tastes good. We get a pleasure out of that. And that's not a bad thing. It needs to be moderated properly. So eutropelia is the proper moderation of this pleasure in your concupiscible appetite. So you're taking rest properly. So St. Thomas says you need to have that, your soul needs to rest. You need to take some pleasure. So you need to take some games, uh, whatever it is, to take a walk, you know, whatever it may form it may be. And that's, that's going to be the context of this. So um, eutropelia, that's the, the virtue of games. So the key part about that is that you're not getting attached to the pleasure. So you're not becoming effeminate. You're not becoming reluctant to suffer because you're so attached to the pleasure. You're just using the pleasure of a game or recreation of some kind to revive your soul. You're taking that rest so that you can then... Uh, go back to the struggle and go back to the fight, go back to suffering. Um, a very pure form of this is just reading fiction, reading a good book, good novels. Um, that's a really great uh, pastime that's, that's really great because St. Thomas then discusses we should never be attached to the pleasure, so don't take too much pleasure, but also and this should be obvious, but we should not sin in this pleasure. So there can't be any sinful pleasure, obviously. So you can't take any pleasure in sin as some kind of pastime, of course. So that is the context wherein we talk about movies. So movies um, came to the fore around the turn of the century. Um, I believe it was late 19th century when um, they were first coming out. And they were called moving pictures. So, because obviously they were just a, a reels of multiple photographs strung together, which made all the images move. So, um, the what what happened was um, in the 1920s, um, the movie companies were beginning to become large, and they realized that um, what you could do with the movie is that you could put sinful things that provoked people's concupiscible appetites that you could put immodesty or you could put blasphemy and profanity or different forms of violence and you could put these things in movies and people would be provoked in their concupiscible appetites and then they would become attached to it and the movie companies realized very quickly that this is how you make money 
It's very simple. You get the populace addicted to something using their concupiscible appetites, and then they keep coming back for more. So in the 1920s, you actually had what we would consider R-rated movies happening in the 1920s, believe it or not. So this was happening where they were starting to show nudity and profanity and things of this kind, and it was becoming more and more big in the 1920s. And this provoked a very strong reaction from Christians, uh, both Protestants and Catholics in America. And the Protestants tried to somehow overcome it and try to stop them from making these profane movies. Um, but they, they failed. They were not able to make any dent in the power structure that was building in Hollywood. But beginning in the 1930s, the Catholic Church took action. And this particularly came out of the Bishop of Philadelphia, who uh, organized a boycott of these movies. They organized what was called the Legion of Decency. Legion of Decency was a um, nationwide fraternity where Catholics would pledge that they would not watch these profane movies under pain of mortal sin. And they organized such a strong boycott that Hollywood was forced to capitulate to the Catholic Church and Hollywood was forced to submit their movies to the Catholic Church, which was it was basically a review board, which would review these movies and then approve or disapprove of their content. So the what happened between 19, around 1932 to around 1965 uh, are what's known as the code years. So the Catholic Church helped create a code that governed the way that Hollywood movies were produced. So they could never have nudity, they could never have blasphemy, profanity, um, things of this nature. Um, they could not glorify evil in a sense where, the, where it was basically teaching people how to be evil, um, things of this nature. And so the Catholic Church was able to force Hollywood to make decent movies. Now, we may sometimes think that, uh, well, didn't this make the movies bad? Actually, no. Um, some of the best movies that are most classic movies were made during this time period. For example, uh, Citizen Kane is considered by many to be the best film ever of all the films. And that was made during this code year. So, so during the code year, the Catholic Church forced Hollywood to, um, to make these movies decent. So, And there was also... Uh, obscenity laws. So there were laws on the books that said that you can't make artwork profane in some way, whether that's blasphemy, profanity, nudity, things of this nature. It's unlawful. So there were these laws on the books. So, but Catholics still went to movies because, like we talked about, utropelia. It's just a recreation. It's a pastime. It's like going to a play. You know, Shakespeare's been around. Plays have been around since the ancient Greeks. So it's a similar to a play, but it's a moving picture. So it's a different sort of format, but it's kind of the same concept. It's telling a story through pictures. Um, so there's nothing really. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. Um, from it can be a great uh, example of utropelia. Um, so having that recreation that you need. But the Catholic Church recognized that um, this cannot be used to um, promote anything that's blasphemous, profane, um, nudity, and that type of thing. Now, the Legion of Decency was approved and promoted by multiple popes as well. So this, this movement spread to other Catholic countries as well. Uh, not that America was a Catholic culture, country, but... This was a movement at the time where the Catholic Church was fighting against Hollywood. Now, long story short, there was a number of Supreme Court cases um, which overturned the, the decency laws. And the Hollywood producers were continually trying to break the code. They were trying to release and get through movies that did have nudity and profanity and things of that nature. So they were trying to get these things out to break the code and eventually they did break the code in the 1960s in America and at that same time the Catholic Church in America was breaking down because there was a world uh, really a worldwide rebellion against the, the the pope and the tradition to try to overturn everything and basically compromise with the world and so at the same time that um, Vatican II and that whole controversy was happening 
the code was being broken in America, and the American cinema really has become since that time, especially with Sweden, the worldwide pusher of pornographic and other explicit videos and movies um, starting in the 1960s all the way till today. So now we live in a time where everyone just kind of goes to movies. We don't think twice much about it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about more about the moral theology of this. So we talked about eutropelia and effeminacy. So we don't, we never need want to be attached to the pleasure, but what about the sinfulness of movies? Is there anything that can be sinful about it? Well, Ripperger notes that there are sins that can be simulated and sins that cannot. And what he means by that is this. Um, in Shakespeare, people are killed. So obviously various, uh, you know, Romeo and Juliet, they both commit suicide at the end. That's um, spoiler alert. Um, so they commit suicide. So obviously suicide is a sin, but it can be simulated, which means that the actor can simulate his suicide without actually committing a sin. So the actor is not committing a sin because he's just simulating it. It's a simulated sin, you know, or some kind of murder that happens in Macbeth or whatever. You know, you, Othello, you know, you, you, someone gets murdered. So you're, the actor is not actually sinning. He's not committing the sin. There's no sin involved in this. Okay. So that's a simulated sin. That's, that's a sin that can be simulated, but other sins are of the nature that cannot be simulated, which means that the actor actually commits a sin when he acts it. And two particular examples are blasphemy and immodesty. So the actor blasphemes in his script. He's saying a blasphemous thing. He's actually committed a sin when he's acting. And an actor that shows immodesty is actually committing a sin. Because those things cannot be simulated. So that's why during the code years, you certainly had uh, simulated sin, you know, they had stories where people were murdered or whatever, but those were simulated sins. They're not actually sins by the actors. They're not sins by the viewers. There's no sin involved. It's, it's portraying a sin, uh, portraying evil. But for those, the, the code was designed to prevent all of the sins that cannot be simulated, that are in fact sinful to, for the actor. And here's the kicker. When an actor commits blasphemy, he blasphemes, he blasphemes against the holy name of Jesus, the name of God, and he commits a sin. Now, that's recorded. It's put on the video. His sin is done. He's done the sin. Now, his sin may be more grave because it's recorded and repeated, but who then has the power to cause his blasphemy again? Well, we do. When we press play, we cause the name of Jesus to be blasphemed. If we're pressing play and causing the actor to blaspheme, we're now the cause of that blasphemy. So now we're participating in that sin. And this is the trouble because most movies and TVs nowadays have blasphemy in some areas. Whether they're saying the name of God, they're saying God, or they're saying the holy name of Jesus where they're saying something else, they're blaspheming and they're sinning. And so we're also participating in that by pressing play, by watching, by giving money to this. So we're participating in the sin. Now, again, this, this part right here, this comes from Ripperger. So this is my opinion and my interpretation of the moral theology to this matter, which has not been definitively taught. So, Tell me your opinion, and if you think that my principles are sound in this matter, please give me your opinion. Um, this is a very difficult matter because, as I said, this blasphemy is everywhere. It's saturated in every TV show, every movie. But um, about a year ago, a year or two ago, I just stopped watching all these movies. And I can tell you it's, it's been a great relief in my spiritual life to try to just focus and not have any part in blaspheming the holy name of Jesus. Um, so that is some of the moral theology involved. Um, and obviously when we talk about immodesty, the other sin that cannot be um, simulated, and there are others, I think, um, 
another thing. I mean, and not only that, but that's one that one is very grave because it can lead you to sin as well, and can lead you to greater sins by viewing this. And so, movies are not neutral. They have there's a great deal of evil that in many movies, TV, and all over the place in this popular culture, and it really it comes back to the companies trying to make money, you know, because they know that they can make more money when they provoke our concupiscible appetites and they give us this pleasure. But we need to be very careful with this and consider this very gravely because it can be a grave situation. So those are some considerations about the moral theology of movies. Um, tomorrow we're going to talk more about this. We're going to talk about more about effeminacy. Uh, we're also going to we'll have Kennedy Hall on. Um, we're going to talk about effeminacy. We'll talk about video games, modern music, and things of that nature, other uh, subjects like that. So send me your questions and your comments. Please like and subscribe. Uh, remember to support our apostolate. Please become a patron. I want to thank all our patrons. Um, patrons, send me all your questions so that we can make videos that respond to um, things you're, you'd like to have us cover. So thanks a lot. Uh, why don't we all pray? Let's pray that um, our eutropelia, our recreation, can always be pure and can be pleasing to the Lord, and that we can take this rest in a way that gives God greater glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.